Hello, everyone. I want to welcome you to Live with Pastor Nancy. I'm so glad you're here and able to join me again today. Uh, as you come on, if you would, if you would just notify me and let me know that you're watching tonight, I would love to be able to um, see who's joining us tonight. Again, I'm still in Colorado and uh, so enjoying it because uh, it's just beautiful, the fall leaf change around here, and this is the first time I've ever gotten to uh, be here for that. So I see so many of you logging on. Hi, uh, Sister Debbie Beachy, you're a blessing to me. Thank you. Though my son is watching, hey, granted, and um, so many of others of you, and then some staff are coming on, and uh, so we're just glad we're just going to take a few moments and let people log on and uh, let them get connected to us tonight. We want to remind you, of course, that our midweek service is coming up and um, that's going to be tonight. That is 630 Pacific time. And so after this is over, there's a bit of time passage uh, and then you can uh, join us for our midweek service there. So I see Pastor Ruby is watching. I miss you, Pastor Ruby. Uh, you're, you're my good travel buddy, except we're not traveling very much anymore except to Colorado. She did get to come out here with us uh, for a time in August. And so her and Pastor Noel came and uh, that was a good time. And so um, we're just glad that you're watching tonight. And uh, I just have some things on my heart. I don't know if you have this book. I want to remind you. Hopefully you have this book. It's um, Sister Newsom's book. It's called The Life of Faith, Mrs. Newsom. And Dad Hagen referred to this book uh, on different occasions. And that's how we heard about it. If you have the book, pull it out and read it again. You know, this is one of those books that as soon as you're done reading, it would it would benefit you to start it all over again or every several months pull it out. You don't want to let it go too long before you have a visit with this book because it is such a blessing. And um, Mrs. Newsom was a missionary down to Mexico years ago and uh, she was, I believe, based in California in fact, somebody had given me some of her materials that were not printed, but um, she, Mrs. Newsom had stayed with friends of hers in California, and she wrote some additional chapters that were never published, and she left those uh, with this couple that she stayed with, and somehow they made a copy of that, made that, made in, was made, uh, made its way into my hands years ago. And so uh, she's a precious, precious lady, a woman of faith. And uh, so I want to refer to some of her, one of her chapters. It's the second chapter in here, and I'm not going to read it per, out of the book per se, but I just want to spotlight some of these things. I mean, these are things that we've been able to teach on over the years, but they just kind of stood up on the inside of me for today. And so I wanted to take that time and share it with you tonight. Um, if you would, um, you can, if you have your Bible available, you can follow along with me at Galatians chapter three. I want to start reading there tonight. Galatians chapter three and verse 13 and 14. It says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us. So the curse that belonged to us, he took our place in it. So that means we're to walk free and live free from any, any aroma or any hint of the curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. So it's letting us know that the time he took that curse was when he was crucified. Verse 14 and this is the reason that he took it, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And so it says that we are redeemed from the curse of the law. Now, what is the curse of the law? The curse of the law is threefold. The curse of the law is spiritual death which spiritual death is simply separation from God. So anyone who's not born again, they're separated from God. And really, uh, any people that are alive in the earth today, 
that um, reject Christ or have not heard, have not received Christ, they're spiritually dead. It's when you get born again that the life of God comes on the inside of you. And so we are redeemed, number one, from spiritual death, number two, from sickness and disease, and number three, from poverty. So this word redeem, it says that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. The word redeemed means to buy back. And I like another definition that says to bring back to its former place. So notice that Christ uh, purchased us so that he could bring us back to our former place. What former place is he talking about? He's talking about before sin entered the world, before Adam sinned. Now, you'll remember that uh, God would come down in the cool of the day, it says in Genesis, and spend time in fellowship with Adam. And so uh, whenever Adam sinned, that fellowship was broken. That place of communion with God was broken. He no more had access to the presence of God. And so this is what we are redeemed back into as though what Adam did had never existed. And so we are redeemed back to our former place. And so when it says that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, he has redeemed us from all of it, not just part of it. So we need to not be okay with any measure of what used to hold us in the past to try to accompany, accompany us in this life as we move forward. So we are redeemed back to the place that Adam had before he sinned. In fact, Jesus came to buy man back, could we say this, back to the image of God, back to the place where we can again walk and talk with God and have fellowship with God. And so just as Adam did before he sinned. And so that's what we have been redeemed back into. And the, that happens because the blood of Jesus has been sprinkled on the mercy seat, has made a way of access into the presence of God. So because Jesus purchased that for us, what? He purchased freedom from the curse for us. It's up to us to experience that and walk in that every day and forbid any remnant, any effects of the curse to, um, to linger on our lives. It is God's plan and his provision that we have none of the effects of the curse clinging to us. That means uh, all that is not of life, all that is not of health, all that's not of strength, soundness, comfort, purity, and holiness, all of that is part of the curse. So we're not to be okay with any effects or any lingering uh, remnants of the curse hanging around our lives. Proverbs chapter 26 and verse 2 says this. It says, the curse causeless shall not come. So if any effect of the curse clings to us, then there's a cause for that. If sickness is clinging to us, we need to find out why. If there's lack that constantly dogs our life, we need to find out why because we have been redeemed from that. And it's up to us not to allow that to try to reattach itself. And so we have to make sure that none of it clings to us, that we're walking in the fullness of our redemption. Now, when it says the curse causeless will not come, I would have to say in my, um, in my estimation that many times the curse that really tries to linger around the life of the believer is due to an unrenewed mind. That people must renew their minds with the word of God so that they're not permissive towards the things that they have been delivered from. And so people haven't always renewed their minds to find out what the word says is theirs. And so because of that, they continue to think wrong. And then the devil is able to hold the effects of the old man on their lives. That lack and sickness and fear that harassed and troubled their lives before they were born again. He endeavors to keep them in that old cycle. And once your mind is renewed, then you quit cooperating with anything that keeps the door open to that. So the fullness of redemption 
is what we is what Jesus has authored for us that we're to walk in the fullness of it not just a measure of it but in the fullness of it um, Ephesians in chapter 4 verses 22 through 24 and I'm going to read this out of the King James translation it says that you put off concerning the former conversation now that conversation means way of life so that you put off concerning the former way of life of the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So notice this, that you can be born again. And the Bible calls us, calls uh, before we were born again, the old man. But now that we're born again, we have a brand new man, a new spirit. But notice this, it says that we're to put off the former way of living that we had under that old man. If I could say it to you this way, is that before we were born again, the old the old man, if we could put it that phrase, the old man uh, taught us how to think, taught us how to conduct life. It gave us our habits. So now that we're a new man, it's up to us to put off what the old man taught us. And just being a new man doesn't mean that the habits or the thinking given to us by being under that old man is put away. We have to renew our minds with the word to put away what the old man taught us, what that that old lifestyle that we had that was separated from God, that didn't have the life of God in our spirits. It is up to us to put that way of living away from us. So verse 23 says, after it says, put off the old man, it says, be renewed in the spirit of the mind. That's how we're going to put off the old man is as we renew our mind, the ways that that old man taught us gets further and further from us. And then verse 24 says, and that you put on the new man. So notice this, you are a new man, but it's up to us to put on the new way of thinking, the new way of living, the new way of believing, the new way of acting, the new way of behaving, that we are to put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So we can put on the new man because that new man is a man of righteousness. That new man is a man of holiness. So anything that is not righteous, or we could say this right in line with God, anything that is not representative of holiness, that we're to set that aside, put that off because anything that isn't righteous and anything that isn't holy is of the old man. The Amplified of verse 22 through 24 says this. Listen to how it reads. Strip yourselves of your former nature. Put off and discard your old, unrenewed self. So listen, we got a brand new spirit. But as I said, that, that old spirit, that dead spirit that was once in you before you were born again, it's not in there any longer. But it taught us things. We've got to strip off what that old man taught us. And this is what it's talking about. Strip yourselves of your former nature, put off and discard your old unrenewed self, which characterized your previous manner of life and becomes corrupt through lusts and desires that spring from delusion. And verse 23, and be constantly renewed in the spirit of your mind having a fresh mental and spiritual attitude. So notice this, that it takes a constant action of renewing our mind. There's never a time that we are we arrive at the complete renewal of the mind. Every day we have to continue that process of renewing the mind. And verse 24, and put on the new nature, the regenerate self that's created in God's image. Godlike in true righteousness and holiness. So notice this. It is up to us to put off what the old man taught us and up to us to yield 
to the new man that's in us. So Paul was writing this in the book of Ephesians to, to those who were born again. He wasn't telling them that God will do this for you. The thing God did do for us is he gave us a new spirit. Now what he's instructing us to do is live out of that new spirit. Let that new spirit dominate us and guide us. And then it says renewing the mind. We have to understand this is spoken of as a factor to which we're going to to as to which man we're going to draw on. So he's letting us know, don't draw on the what the old man taught you. Draw on what the new man teaches you. Listen, you don't know what the new man is teaching you unless you renew your mind. So that is the way that we can yield to the new man and draw on the new man is we must renew our minds to take on a new way of thinking, which is the thoughts of the word. So renewing the mind is spoken of as a factor as to which man we're going to live out of. If we don't put the new man on every day, then that means we're just going to draw out of the old man. It's so easy to slip back into the old way of living, the old way of thinking, the old way of speaking. And so that's why we must continue to renew our minds so we don't slip back into that. And uh, so we are to draw out of the new man because that's where the life and the nature of God is. Listen, we, were, we are the ones who are instructed, as I said, to put off that old man, to put off the ways of that old man, and to put on the ways of the new man. And so notice, it's not something that happens automatically at the new birth. It's something that we have to do on a continual basis. That is, we choose to live out of the new man than the old man. Listen, you know, and, and I say this kind of comically or facetiously, but um, whenever you go shopping, ladies, it's, let me talk especially here to the ladies for a minute. Whenever you go shopping, the old man always taught you, you don't have enough money. You can't afford this. You got to buy the cheapest thing. If it's not on sale, you can't have it. And you can't have more than one of it, you know? And so that's what the old man taught, taught you. But the new man is my God will supply the new man with the renewed mind knows this, God gives us richly all things to enjoy is what the word said. So I've said this to our congregation different times. Don't take the old man shopping with you. You won't come out with near as much as if you take the new man shopping with you. <laughs> so you decide which man shops with you, the old man or the new man. Um, now, I'm not saying and I'm not advocating that you go out and you overspend. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a mentality that you take the new man mentality that quit treating yourself as not, um, if I could say this, that you don't deserve the best. You do deserve the best because you are new. And so how do we put on the new man? As we said, we renew our minds, but also we yield to our spirits instead of yielding to the flesh because in your spirit is the life and the nature of God. So we renew our minds, but we also yield to and respond to and draw out of our spirits. Now Colossians chapter 2 and verse 6 instructs us, as you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, walk ye in him. Ah, listen to that. As you have received him, walk in him. And notice this, so you can receive him and not be walking in him. That's what he's encouraging us. Here, Paul is encouraging us in Colossians, uh, warning us that since we've received him, now let's walk in him. Well, walk in him. This word walk in the new covenant under the New Testament, it means this, your manner of living. So he's saying, uh, since you have received Christ, now Conduct your life like you have received him. Walk in him. Yield to him. Respond to, to him on the inside of you. So Paul wouldn't instruct us to do this if there was no danger of not doing it. So if I could say this, to walk in him also involves to abide in him. Now we know we belong to Christ and we abide in him in the sense that we belong to him, but we are to abide in him in the fullness, in the sense of to where we are being governed and we're being led and conducting our lives uh, in line with how he would have us to live. First John in chapter two in verse six tells us, he that saith he abide, abides in him, ought himself also to walk, even as he walked. Ah, 
So now we see even more clearly, what does it mean to walk in him? It means to walk as he walked. That means if we're walking as he walked, then we're going to be producing what he produced in his life. So his life was an example of what our lives are to be producing. This is the place where we experience the fullness of redemption. Now, earlier in this, in this uh, recording, I was talking about that the fullness of redemption, meaning none of, none of what we've been redeemed from clings to us. No sickness, no lack, no torment, no fear. None of that clings to us so that we walk in the fullness of what belongs to us and not just in a measure of what we've been redeemed from. And so here, how do we walk in the fullness uh, uh, to where sickness can't cling to us? How do we walk to where lack cannot trouble our lives? That we are we walk free from fear. How is that possible? We're, we're told here, as we walk in him. That means as we conduct our lives in the same way he conducted his. And let me tell you, it is possible. We are to overcome just as Jesus overcame. He is our example to follow. And so we are to follow his example and walk the kind of life that he demonstrated. Now, many will think this standard's too high. <laughs> like, we can't do that. I mean, like he was a son of God. Uh, how can we ever meet that standard? Well, we are made the sons of God, that we are righteous in him. He has made us holy in him. So we absolutely can. And Hebrews chapter six and verse one tells us, let us go on unto perfection. Well, what's that mean? Well, perfection means full maturity. So anytime you see the word in the new covenant, uh, this word perfection normally means uh, fullness of maturity to full-grown adulthood spiritually. So uh, evidently, the word does expect us to reach the standard of Jesus, the, the standard that Jesus set for us, that we are to equal what he did. Listen, you'll remember he said, the works that I do shall you do also. Ah, what's that mean? We're equaling what he produced. How can we do that? We walk as he walked. How do we walk as he walked? We abide in him. We abide in the word. If I could say this, we live conscious of the indwelling presence of God. We live conscious of the indwelling power of God. We live conscious that the greater one is on the inside of us. I want to read to you out of Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 13. And this is the Amplified Translation. It says that it might develop. Now, see, he was talking about that the fivefold gift ministries were given to the body of Christ. And part of the reason of that is that we might develop until we all attain oneness in the faith and in the comprehension of the full and accurate knowledge of the Son of God. Well, what's that mean? It means that our minds are renewed. To have full and accurate knowledge of the Son of God, that we would comprehend that that this is uh, that we are to have our minds renewed. And then notice what it says next. For the one who is renewing their minds, that we might arrive at really mature manhood. Not just staying in a young state spiritually, but going on to full mature manhood. And it says the completeness of personality, which is nothing less than the standard height of Christ's own perfection. So how do we know that we're maturing? We're becoming more like Christ. How do we know we're growing up spiritually? That our lives are looking more as he would have, as he walked, we're walking that same way. And then it goes on in the Amplified and it says, the measure of the stature of the fullness of the Christ and the completeness found in him. Ah, so the example he set for us and the standard he set for us is not too high of a, of, a, of a standard for us to achieve or walk or walk according to. How do we do that? As we renew our minds and as we yield to our spirits, follow our spirits and respond to our spirits rather than just responding to the old man, responding to the flesh. How seldom we find someone 
who the effects of the curse aren't clinging to. Now, remember, we started with this, that we have been redeemed from the curse of the law. But we could all say that there are times that the effects of the curse have clung to us in the sense of symptoms have been there, lack has been there, uh, some live under the torment of fear, some living depressed. Why is that? The effects of having been under the curse are still are still living with them, but we're redeemed from the curse. So we should not be okay with the effects of the curse still trying to attach themselves and cling to our lives. But how often, or let me say this, how seldom we find someone where none of that is clinging to them. So how do we come to the place where there is no hint of the curse that tries to cling to us? One place abiding in him, walking as he walked, living as he lived. We're doing, we're to be doing what Psalms 91 in verse one says, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the most high shall abide under the shadow of the almighty. Now listen, they shall abide there, not just visit there. I remember years ago, uh, I was at home and actually one day, I was vacuuming the house, and while I was vacuuming, out of my spirit came this verse, Psalm 91, verse 1. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So I, that, was, that verse just, uh, before I even realized it, came out my mouth, and then out came the question, do you know what the secret place is? And evidently, I, and I recognize that, the, that God was asking me this. Do you know what the secret place is? And I thought, well, evidently I don't or you wouldn't be asking me. And so, I mean, I was maybe about 24 or 25 at the time, you know, a year or two ago. And um, so uh, he said, the secret place is the realm of the spirit, walking in the spirit. So we could say it this way for the, for the believer that he that walketh in the spirit shall abide in the sh in, under the shadow of the Almighty. So this is the place where none of the curse can cling to us, that when we are abiding in his presence, walking in the light of the word, living as Jesus lived, walking as Jesus walked, nothing touches us there in that presence, where in that secret place where we abide. Another thing, that is that when we look at Jesus's life, we see, we see this, the abundance of fruit, that every single day his life was bearing fruit. How important, you know, so much of the time people say, I want a stronger anointing. I want a greater anointing. Well, those things are wonderful and that's right. But my thing is I want to bear fruit. And this is what glorifies God is the bearing of fruit because there are a lot of people who may have an anointing on them, but they're not necessarily bearing all the fruit that they could be bearing. So Jesus was always bearing fruit. So uh, how do we bear the most fruit possible? Can I tell you this? By abiding in him, walking in him, walking in the spirit, renewing our minds with the word of God and living the kind of life that he has planned for us. And for and if I could say this, for us to quit being okay with any residue of the curse trying to cling to our lives because we're redeemed from that curse. We should not be okay with symptoms. Listen, I've been there where I put up with stuff. Uh, we've all been there where we put up with what we shouldn't have put up with. But I noticed this about God, that he, allow, he lets us have anything we're okay with. But if we decide we're not okay with it, his power will back us up. So if we're wanting to bear more fruit in our lives, if I could say it this way, don't just focus on, I'm trying to bear more fruit. I'm trying to bear more fruit. Focus on abiding in him because that's where the fruit bearing comes from. That when we're abiding in him and walking in him, and we are following him, yielding to him, responding to him, uh, responding and walking in the spirit. So as we abide in him by walking as he walked, then nothing of the curse can cling to us. Listen, this is what God has planned for us to where nothing of the curse clings to us because we're redeemed from it. And so I encourage you, I remind you of these things. And can I say one of the greatest rewards of being redeemed is fellowship with the Father. 
I mean, that's our great joy is fellowshipping with the Father, fellowshipping with Jesus, uh, being indwelt by the Holy Spirit. So let us, if I could say this, give proper attention to that because as we do and as we walk in the Spirit, it makes all things easy. And so I know this, that the times when um, I'm more mindful of the greater one that's on the inside of me, and if I could say it this way, it's not about getting in the presence of God, uh, literally. I mean, in the sense of we know this, he's in us. We are in his presence. But if I could say this, now let's conduct living mindful of that. Because it's not trying, it's not reaching, trying to get you know, trying to get God to, if I could say this, come down to meet us. He's in us. It's us turning our attention toward him and living mindful of the greater one that's in you. So I just want to remind you, we are redeemed from the curse of the law. Let's not be okay with any measure of it clinging to us. And the way we do that is we put off the old man. We put on the new man as we abide in Christ and as we are live mindful of the presence of God. Uh, I love you. I'm so glad that you could join me tonight, and uh, it won't be long that we'll be able to um, have regular services back together. That's what we're looking for, right? And then the people on the road, I miss getting to see you as well. Uh, some of the congregations on the road that I've gotten to go to so frequently, uh, the, your faces are so familiar to me, and you become my extended family, and uh Still a part of the same household, just in a different room of the household. So I look forward to whenever we get to get back together again. Thank you for joining me. I love you, and we will see you next week. God bless you.